Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. This is the Band Books Podcast, and we are in episode... What episode is this? 109. 109, and that is Gillespie. Killing and Willen, Maxson, and Relaxon. And I am Donovan Riley. We are going to, as promised or suggested, dive into Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And we were just discussing before we hit record that I see this book everywhere in church libraries, and you've rarely ever seen this book in a church library. I only know about it probably from you, and then, I don't know, if somebody like Jordan Peterson mentioned it, I'm sure, at some point. That's it. Never seen it in a church. We've read Saze, which I rarely, if ever, see in any church library, maybe twice in the last 20-some years. Mm-hmm. I, I found Bonhoeffer in some church libraries, time to time, usually Cost of Discipleship or his book on ethics. Or the Psalms, maybe. Or maybe. The, I, I've never actually seen that one in my, my journeys. Okay. But the point being, then, is that I've seen, you know, My Utmost for His Highest, for example, by Chambers. Oh, right. And I've yeah. seen Man's for, Search for Meaning by Frankel, and that's why I wanted to cover this, because... For those of you who don't know, Viktor Frankl did survive the Nazi death camps. He's Jewish, was Jewish. And coming out of that experience, and obviously he had some questions mm-hmm. about God and the meaning of everything. Because as Frankl himself reflected after the fact, the worst of us walked out of those gates because those who clung to their beliefs and those who stood on their principles were usually the first to be executed because they wouldn't bend. And they wouldn't do what was necessary to survive, such as lying, stealing, um, doing anything that one had to do to survive. Yeah. And as a consequence, as he points out, you know, when Israel was formed in 1948, uh, it was occupied, in his opinion, by the worst of Israel, not the best. And as I often tell people about the United States, if you go back to the colonies, for example, it was a hothouse for heresy. Mm-hmm. That those, you know, we, we were taught in elementary school, the people who came here were coming and searching for religious freedom, which is true yeah. in a very nondescript way. What they were actually coming for is because they were tired of being arrested and burned at the stake and beheaded for being heretics. Or even, in some cases, I think that's trumped up a bit. They really saw cheap farmland and, well, yeah, there's yeah, that too. And then, oh, yeah, we can uh, have some more religious freedom. And, not and many of these groups were um, millennial apocalyptic movements. Right. So there was that aspect of it, too, of the, the new world was kind of the bomb shelter. <laughs> well, they thought they could do it better here because yeah. they weren't under any kind of uh, oppressive regime or just, right. you know, religious um, conformity, you know, necessity to conform. Think about... Great Britain and the Counter Reformation, and how every ruler, every other ruler, would would be a different religion. So you had a Roman <laughs> Catholic ruler, then a Protestant ruler, and other than Thomas Cranmer, most folks did end up being jailed or executed, depending on which side of the street you're on. Yeah, and you had the Huguenots, and you had the Mennonites, and you had what became the Amish, and you had the Puritans, and all the different Puritanical movements. And the they Methodists. came here because they were false. They were they were false teachers. They were heretics. Right, and. So the United, you know, American evangelical Christianity, similarly to what Frankel talks about with Israel as a country, with all these folks that survived the death camps going there. And again, this is Frankel's opinion, not mine. And obviously, it's a sweeping over generalization. But he's just pointing out the people that walked out of the death camps did what they needed to do to survive, for the most part. Likewise, those who came to this country and formed what would become the basic foundation of American Christianity were heretics. And therefore, American evangelical Christianity, to its core, is heresy. This is still happening. We talked about that with the uh, United Methodist Church and the split, and how the Africans right. are like, "What's wrong with you, American Methodists?" <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because they're they're the renegades. The Americans right. are the renegades. It's the worldwide uh, Methodists. We see this with Lutherans too. You know, right? And uh, Anglicans and, and Anglicans. Yeah. yeah, the faithful ones are you know in in Asia or in in Africa, right. and and it's the Americans that are these radical, like individualistic, um, right? You know, liberal kind of approach that that are the outliers now. Yeah. And maybe always yeah. have been. Probably always have been, but in our arrogance and in this bubble that we live in in this country, because we are technically on an island in relation to the rest of the world, we tend to see ourselves as being the spiritual and moral authority right. on well, most things. Isn't that just an application of the you know political authority that we think we have as well applied to absolutely. the church? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like we, we it's like Jeremiah says, we've we've lost our ability to blush. Mm-hmm. So when the African bishops or 
the the bishops from Southeast Asia, for example, they come and demand that the United States repent of X, Y, or Z reasons. We tend to think of them in terms of, well, you're what what can you possibly have to teach me? Well, it's interesting you mentioned both of those, or I did, that uh, those are also places where, you know, the more radical elements of Islam are at their front door. Correct, sir. Yeah, or back door, as the case may yeah. be. Yeah. And so with Frankel then, it's it's he's coming out of the death camp. He's kind of, he's trying to figure out what happened, why it happened. And we talked with Gerke last episode, the last couple episodes about, you know, being a chaplain in the Nazis and ministering to a guy like Gehring, who believed to his core that what he did was not only right, but God blessed. Hmm. Or that at least he as an individual was blessed by God. And then he pointed out those signs. And on the flip side then, you have Frankel, who's a psychotherapist and a neurologist. So he's attempting to understand this from the therapeutic side of things. Right. And again, he is Jewish and depending on, on how you want to take it, he, there is a, a, some theological underpinnings to his therapeutic talk. But that's why I wanted to cover Frankel, because he's not writing a book that's intentionally theological. No, I mean, and yet, the, the original title, I think, is interesting. It was a, a, a psychologue, er, Leipt das Konzentrationslager, or however you pronounce that, right? right? So, it's the psychology of the concentration camp, yes. right? And then the first right. English title was From Death Camp to Existentialism. This is when marketing wasn't a big deal. Uh, right? Right. They're like, Where, I want to read about death camps and existential. I don't even know what that means. So, then, right. yes, now it has the more hip title that uh, seems more Man, appropriate. Meaning. Yeah, exactly. But like I said... And the reason I want to cover this is because it is coming out of the Second World War. It is coming out of a person and a group's experience within the context of the Second World War. And because I've seen it in so many church libraries, and then when I attempted to read it and realized, oh, wait, one, this isn't Christian, and two, this isn't really even theological. Mm -mm. But over the years, coming back to it and ruminating on it, what I've realized is that, and we've talked about this, is that the influence of of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis on theology in the 20th century in particular, right. and the, the rise in popularity of clinical practical education and experience. Uh, I know when I went to seminary that the language of pastoral care and the pastoral care classes I took were almost entirely couched in the language of psychoanalysis. Yeah, and they were clinical. Yeah. And then we mix, it's called paramixta in the old days. Mm -hmm. That is, we're mixing two things together like oil and water that don't. And therapeutic language and theological language don't mix unless you willfully ignore that we're working with different sets of definitions to words. We're, we're working with different understandings of the human being, right. of anthropology, all of these things. Well, psychology is a, and it's only been about 200 years as its own mm -hmm. like separate science that right. really belongs under the bigger umbrella of philosophy. So it's seeking yeah, wisdom, but specifically the wisdom of the mind, I suppose. Right. And like I mentioned, if you read Man's Search for Meaning and you're familiar with Stoic philosophy, a lot of Stoic principles end up being woven into Frankl's logotherapy, and mm -hmm. we'll define that in a second. But that's what Frankl's doing, is he's essentially saying the previous psychological models of Freud and Adler, which were the two most popular, they're incapable of holding the weight of this experience that we've just walked out of. Because Freud and Adler couldn't have even comprehended, they couldn't right. have imagined this experience of the Jews in the death camps. Yeah. And what do you, you read the definition to me before we went on air, mm -hmm. but um, Freud being, you know, the, the psychology of pleasure, I suppose, right? Yeah. Well, here, let me just read it. So, logotherapy was developed by, well, and before we even get into it, logos, is the Greek for word, logos, the Greek for Jesus. Right, but this is preeminent wisdom, right? But this is preeminent wisdom in a, in a Greek sense, but not in a fully Greek sense. Hmm. So, Frankel takes the word logos, applies it to therapy as a contraction, and then kind of spins out his own definition, which is what academics are supposed to do. That's how you create a <laughs> job for yourself. But I think this too, though, goes to the point of when Christians see the word logos there, even if it's logotherapy, we tend to just go, oh, he's talking about the logos, meaning the word of God or Jesus or even the ancient Greek meaning of the word logos. Uh -huh. He's not. 
But he is. And that's, I think, why it's... He's co-opting it for his own use. Yeah, it's seductive in that sense or Mm -hmm. deceitful in that sense because we see something that sounds familiar or looks familiar and then we attempt to bend it to our own presuppositions. How does this fit within my worldview or my language, my lexicon? So, logotherapy was developed by neurologist and psychiatrist Viktor Frankl on a concept based on the premise that the primary motivational force of an individual is to find a meaning in life. So, that's the primary purpose. That's the motive for every human being, according to Frankl. The the why question. The why. Why am I here? What's the meaning of life? This was considered the third Viennese school of psychotherapy. Freud's psychoanalysis was the first. Adler's individual psychology was the second. Heavy emphasis on subjectivism there with Adler. Okay. So, logotherapy is based on an existential analysis, meaning what is the relation of the individual to the universe? Or as a famous book, life, the universe, and everything. Yep. It's a very existential statement. And obviously then he focuses on Kierkegaard (laughs) and Kierkegaard's will to meaning. That's where Frankel kind of gets his his start. The impetus for this is from Kierkegaard asking. And Kierkegaard, a pastor's kid, Lutheran a pastor's, pastor's kid, kid. Yeah. seminary trained, yep. yeah, yeah, church outlaw. And so Kierkegaard's point is, actually the purpose of life is to ask the question, what is the meaning of my life? Why am I here? Nietzsche comes along after that and says, no, that's not the primary motive for life. The primary motive for life is the will to power. Mm. That is, the question is, how can I accumulate power? How can I dominate others? Thus, the purpose for institutions and so forth. And then finally, you have Freud, who said, no, the purpose and meaning of life is the will to pleasure. How does this make me feel? Hmm. So, we have the will to meaning. Why am I here? We have the will to power. How can I dominate and control other people? And then finally, the will to pleasure. How does this make me feel? Which, if you attended church for any length of time whatsoever, you've heard all three of these. When I was thinking about a practical application of all three is, um, we talked about uh, eugenics and specifically, I think we brought up abortion, but you can do it at the other end of life. I mean, how often do you sit at somebody's bedside who's incapacitated due to age or illness, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, that this is their question is like, I can't do anything. That's will to power, right? Yeah. I can't do anything. I, I can't feel anything. Right. Right. I can't, I don't enjoy this life anymore. So, you know, will to pleasure. And then, and I can't, I have no Why purpose. Why am I still here? I have, yeah. Because I can't do anything and I can't feel anything, then mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't have a reason to exist. Exactly. And then that leads to, to um, euthanasia, right? And we were just talking about, before we went on air, an article that a friend of ours published on Facebook, right up the road from me, actually, 40 minutes up the road, there's a church that's actually, they just had a meeting, this isn't a joke, where they're going to move the elderly out of their church and have them go to a different place. Because they're worship. holding them back. Because they're holding them back from attracting young families. Same thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all three rolled up into one. And I think this is why when you read Man's Search for Meaning in Frankel and you read this kind of stuff, even though it might sound kind of uh, vague or fuzzy and you need some help filling in the blanks, it appeals to us. Because, again, it's the language. It's the air that we breathe. Well, we've talked about it uh, probably in almost every show that we've done is to say your your purpose or your your identity is is not bound up in, in how you feel about yourself right. or what you think about yourself or even your capacity to do anything. Mm-hmm. It's right. actually bound up in what God says about you, who right. you are in Him. And Which so it's is external. why we always default to a religion of works because that drives us nuts <laughs> that we can't have any control, will to power over our life and the goal and the purpose of our life that somehow that's all out of our hands. It's all been given. Yeah. Yeah. Externally determined. (laughs) Right. And we hate that because again, we lack both choice then and control. And it actually violates every principle then of psychology. Exactly. Exactly. And so a short introduction to this system of logotherapy is given in Frankl's most famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, in which he outlines how his theories helped him to survive his Holocaust experience and how that experience further developed and reinforced his theories. And to, there are it's a, a number of logotherapy institutes around the world today as a consequence. So it's not like this was a fad. No. This had traction, does have traction. Like I was saying to, to Gillespie before one on the air, this is kind of the ecosystem I live in, in the martial arts, CrossFit, sure. health and wellness world. Get your is, life together. Yeah, 
take take responsibility for your life, be accountable, Exercise be disciplined. disciplined. Yep. If you don't like where you're at, change everything. Whatever you don't like, change it. And there is a, I mean, there is a purpose, to, I mean, or a benefit to that. It's just limited. Right. Well, we would say it's limited to one kingdom. Right. right. It's not existential. It's it's actually just practical. Right. Right, exactly. And and there's, like I was saying yesterday on the, the Warrior Priest podcast, the dichotomy is we are called to sacrifice for the sake of the neighbor, love our neighbors ourselves. But if we don't love love ourselves then we can't love our neighbor. So therefore, if we don't take care of ourself in, a, in an earthly sense, we can't take care of our neighbor in an earthly sense. And there's a consequence of to that, that, excuse me, of then if I can't take care of myself, I can't take care of my neighbor, how then can we organize and put together a place where we can gather for worship on Sunday? And how can we make sure that mm -hmm. we have Sunday school teachers and that we have the proper hymns for worship or the, the pastor shows up with his Bible study and sermon well-prepared? And so one doesn't necessarily, you know, again, having your vocation tightened up does not affect your salvation. At all. Yeah, justification, you know, the, but is separate. But as a consequence of justification, it sets you free to tighten up your vocation so sure. that you can show up for your neighbor. Sure. Yep. But we always want to confuse that, like I said, to turn vocation into the means of salvation. Right. The search for meaning, that's already been accomplished. It's done. Right. Right. <laughs> you don't yeah. have to look for it. You already have it. Which is annoying. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what's the purpose of my life? I don't know. What do you want to do? Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> have some fun. Mm -hmm. Enjoy this world. Enjoy right. this life. Well, and the other dichotomy, too, is that as people are discovering more and more nowadays, especially in the United States, because of just the the consequences of uh, other people's hard work <laughs> and yeah. struggle and suffering, is that we live in a bubble of safety and leisure. And we've had it we, better now than we've ever had it. You're not kidding. As I said... Even our poor people are obese. <laughs> and with satellite and, TV and cell phones. Of course. And as a consequence, we, as Sebastian Junger points out in his book, Tribe, and this plays into what Frankel's talking about, Junger points out, you don't have, like in Minnesota, single college-age women who are carrying and concealing firearms is on the rise in Minnesota, which is ironic when you consider how liberal our state is mm -hmm. and how hard we push a liberal agenda. Everybody's basically a good person. Violence is anachronistic, and it's usually white people, men in particular. And but it's that's constant narrative. narrative, yeah. <laughs> but the problem is, is that people on the ground in everyday life recognize where I live, it's dangerous, and therefore, I, like I said, we tend to we want to be binary about all these things. It's either this or it's that. So if I say I'm anti-war but pro-soldier, or I'm anti-death but pro-gun, people are like, but those are contradictory. I'm like, no, they're actually not. Just keeping them in their spheres and their realms. Right, I'm anti-violence. I'm against violence, but I'm trained to kill people. That's not, again, that's a dichotomy, but they're not mutually exclusive. Right. The, your training is only useful when it's needed, not... Right. <laughs> that's not something you, you do every right. day. Right. You, you train so that you don't have to get in fights, and you train so that you don't have to engage in violence all the time, because a person, that's the meaning of the word meek. When Jesus says, blessed are the meek, that word in Greek literally means someone who knows how to use a sword, but chooses to keep it sheathed. The, the, this was my, my kids that did martial arts, although they're on hiatus at the moment. That was always the first rule. It's like, if you can run away, just run away. <laughs> right. You don't have to right. fight. Too many variables. Yeah. If right. you have to fight, here's the tools. But right. if you don't have to fight, just don't. run away. Right. Yeah. Once I tell people, like, well, what, Jesus says turn the other cheek. Yeah, and I do. But if you put hands on my wife or my children, remember my congregation, I have to love my neighbor as myself. I have to keep the fifth commandment. That's yeah. kind of how this works. Yeah, it's not one a, or the other. Those things are intention, of course. Right. And it's a dichotomy, but that's what it means to be a sinner mm -hmm. in a fallen world with a savior like Jesus. Is I don't want to have to kill you, but if I do, then oh well. Right. I'll sleep very soundly tonight. Yeah. Um, and so Frankel is wrestling with these questions. I I, ra I was raised in a Jewish community in Germany, and all of a sudden, one day, we're rounded up, put on trains, mm -hmm. shipped off, and we lost everything that we've ever had, and we're put in these barracks, and these people are beating us and want to murder us, and we don't really understand why, based on lies, by the way. And now we're betraying each other. And yet, we claim to be godly people. We claim to be the chosen people of God. And the word holocaust is what we usually translate as burnt offering, by the way. Yep. And that's what the word Holocaust means, if you never knew it. It means burnt offering or sacrifice. Correct. 
And therefore, Trunkel's asking the question, we were a burnt offering, we were a sacrifice. But to what but God, I suppose. Exactly, to what God and to what purpose. Mm. So thus, man's search for meaning. What is the purpose, what is the meaning of this Holocaust? Why is this happening to us again? Because in the Old Testament, we know it's unrepentance. They turned away from God. Mm -hmm. Which gave them over to their desires. Right. So, we're going to dive in towards the end of the book, actually, because there's a lot of stuff at the front end of the book that's a lot of heavy therapeutic lifting that we don't need to go into because I don't think theologically it affects the church. But this stuff at the end, in my experience, like I said, finding this book in so many church libraries and then listening to the general overall civic religious tone in our in our society, this stuff comes out. So, towards the end, he has a section here on the meaning of life. Then he has the essence of existence, then the meaning of love, and then the meaning of suffering. And so, diving in, the meaning of life. I doubt whether a doctor can answer this question in general terms. Again, he's writing as a doctor, as a clinical psychotherapist, as a neurologist, not as a theologian. Mm -hmm. I just want to point that out there because I'm not critiquing Frankel as a theologian because I don't think that's fair. But I'm critiquing everyone who reads him as a theologian and then tries to translate this into their theology. Just add some Jesus to it. Yep. So, I doubt whether a doctor can answer this question in general terms. That is the meaning of life. For the meaning of life differs from man to man, from day to day, from hour to hour. What matters, therefore, is not the meaning of life in general, but rather the specific meaning of a person's life at a given moment. To put the question in general terms would be comparable to the question posed to a chess champion. Quote, tell me, master, what is the best move in the world? There simply is no such thing as the best or even a good move apart from a particular situation in a game and the particular personality of one's opponent. It's the same in fighting. The same holds for human existence. One should not search for an abstract meaning of life. Everyone has his own specific vocation or mission in life to carry out a concrete assignment which demands fulfillment. Hmm. You you can hear it, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's got find your calling, story. find your purpose, find your vocation, find your vocation yeah. and and everybody's different. And every, but everyone's got one. But everyone's got one. Hmm. So what's the purpose of the church then when we translate this? What's the purpose of the church? To help people find fulfillment. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. This is why we have to have demographic research. So that at their at your funeral we can say well done good and faithful servant exactly <laughs> and we can say well we have a singles Bible study for single people and we have a married couples mm-hmm. Bible study and a family Bible study and an elderly Bible study and we have a children's church service separate from the regular church service and we have a teen youth service on Wednesday nights that separate from the children's service you saw the uh, the retreat uh, is out west somewhere where it's for single Lutherans to come and find their spouse Oof. that's actually what it that's the whole umbrella that's what it's for <laughs> it's like right on this is like well it's like uh what do they call that it's like round couples dating mixers or yeah it's a mixer there you go <laughs> uh-huh. okay. it's gonna go awesome. well yeah absolutely you know, high functioning on the spectrum luther there we go <laughs> more like one you should, right one should not search for an abstract meaning of life then mm-hmm. that it, I, I as i tell new students the purpose of of training is not to say I want to get better at this. Mm. That's too general. It's too abstract. You're going to get frustrated because you're going to suck at this for a long time. Yeah, and what does that even mean? You need a short-term goal, a, a medium-range goal, and a long-term goal, and you've got to set goals for every day that you're here. Uh, they have to be very specific. Why? And really, because only the short-term goal is the only one that's like concrete at that point. 100%. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Every day, the short-term goal will add up to the other longer-term goals. Likewise, then, what he's pointing out is that abstract meanings for life will actually lead you to end up frustrated with your life because they're a, what a moving target it's it's a yeah it's a moving target it's an unachievable it's not real you can't put your hands around it so you need a specific vocation and a specific mission in your life that you need to carry out as a concrete assignment that demands fulfillment that's the key point it demands fulfillment therein he cannot be replaced nor can his life be repeated Thus, everyone's task is as unique as is his specific opportunity to implement it. Just like Jesus. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like uh, the message of the New Testament, right? Um, where we're joined to Christ, and we're, but it's one body, but we're each 
individual members and we have individual Correct. tasks. Yeah. So I can see how this is easily applied to that. And that's a good point is that when I was at seminary and Annie and I would attend synagogue on Saturday nights because I was studying Hebrew and I wanted to actually learn how to speak Hebrew. And the only way to really do that was to go to a synagogue. That Where it's a mile a minute and yeah. Oh my goodness, are they fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, which definitely gets you up to speed quickly. But the point is, is that I was very curious about what the rabbi's message was mm -hmm. going to be. Mm -hmm. And it was always about community. It was always about being Jewish and Jewish identity within a community. And that so, defines meaning. Exactly. So every message that the rabbi delivered on Saturday night was about community, community projects, community outreach, doing things together as Jewish people, the traditions, the food, everything. And so it was very Lutheran in that Midwestern sense of being Lutheran that you have worship and then you have fellowship time afterwards with Potlucks. coffee, and potlucks, you do outreach, you do like a Habitat for Humanity project or a soup kitchen or these kinds of things. Highway cleanup, yeah. Yeah, but this was within the Jewish identity of of being Jewish and what that means within our traditions and, and maintaining our traditions, because that then is what connects us to God, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Frankl is talking about here. There's that underpinning of his Jewish upbringing of, we're in this together, but we're all individuals who have a specific vocation that cannot be replaced by anybody else. You are a special person. Yeah. Within the group, though. Mm -hmm. That you are special, you are a snowflake. However, the purpose of that specificity, that specialness, is to contribute to the overall well-being of the community. Right. So he would obviously reject, um, you know, Hitler's approach and saying Hitler, <laughs> yeah. you know, th that savior mentality where he's yeah. everything and anything. You know. Yeah. He, he's he, he's got his feet in every realm. You know, a totalitarian kind of approach. He's he's rejecting mm -hmm. that. He's saying you have a very narrow and specific um, purpose within the yes. whole. Mm. So as each situation in life represents a challenge. It represents a challenge. It may not actually be a challenge, but it represents one to man and presents a problem to him to solve or for him to solve. The question of the meaning of life may actually be reversed. Again, how many times have you said, and I just recently was made aware of this and stopped doing it, but how many of us our entire life say, I have a problem? Or, oh, here comes another problem. Everything's a problem. We, de we define our life in terms of the problems. Exactly. I need to resolve this issue, this issue, this issue today. How many times at a family function or at church on Sunday morning when you're chatting or at work or at school, it's always about the problem that you have with somebody. I got a problem with that guy. Or oh, this problem came up and I don't know how to figure it out. Everything's and, a problem. And that's why, uh, like we talked about earlier here, the message of justification that you're that you're actually set free from that. that right. You're, you're actually free from all the problems because your sins are forgiven. Right. <laughs> well, I just wrote an article for Christ Old Fast entitled, There's Nothing Wrong With You. Or yeah, was there it? you go. 15, 17. And I said, here's a radical statement. There's nothing wrong with you. Now, if you fall entirely into the theological ditch, that's a stupid thing to say. There's right. a lot. that's In fact, everything is wrong with me in relation to Jesus. Everything needs forgiveness. Correct. On the vocational side... There's a lot that's wrong with me that can be improved. But in relation to Jesus, and I was going off of what Paul says to the Corinthians, that I don't actually find any sin within me to judge. <laughs> Which is a crazy statement. It right, 100%. Especially it, after he got done berating them uh, right. for pages. But to say, listen, Paul says, in relation to Jesus, in relation to your justification, there's nothing wrong with you. Hmm. But we beat each other over the head with all of our theological problems in relation to God and all of our vocational problems. In, but in relation to Christ. Issues with your prayer life. Yes. Difficulties exactly. singing. Your heart. faith isn't strong enough. Your love isn't, you know, excited enough. Your prayer life is weak. Your, your piety attendance, isn't. Your attendance yeah. is unfaithful. Yeah. They're all problems. Mm -hmm. But as Dakota Myers says, leukemia is a problem. Genocide is a problem. Being five minutes late for church is an inconvenience. Not, in fact, in the United States, most of our problems are actually just inconveniences. Well, and even, um, you know, the, the major problem in the church, <laughs> the most significant yeah. problem, it's not sin, by the way, it is... Uh, money? Yeah, money. <laughs> so, you say, I mean, how big of a problem is it? Well, it is inconvenient. It might limit what you can do or what not to, but it, does it ever really, can it ever really get in the way of the preaching of the gospel, administration of the sacraments? It can when it breaks loose into full-blown idolatry. Well, I suppose, but I mean, just practically speaking. Practically? Like, no, of course not. Like, how much money do you need to preach the gospel? I'll preach in the parking lot if the church burns down. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I had a friend, their church burned down. They had church service that Sunday. So, the church burned down Saturday night. 
They got to church to find out that it had burned down. They called the fire department, and then they went and met down the road in a guy's barn. While the church was burning. Yeah. And then after church, they came back and called insurance and started the process. And in fact, my friend said he actually left. He was actually kind of forced to resign after they built the new church. While they met in that barn, and the guy, the guy who gave them his barn, every week he would fix it up a little bit more, mm-hmm. and it got better and nicer inside. And by the end of the year, it's not my a pole barn said, anymore; it's a church. He, yeah, he said that was the the happiest that I'd ever been, and the happiest as a congregation that we'd ever been, and the healthiest spiritually that we had ever been. And as soon as we moved into our new building, it all disappeared mm-hmm. to the you, extent that they actually said, "We don't want you to be our pastor anymore." The building became an idol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, we don't have problems. We have inconveniences for the most part. Ultimately, then, he writes, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather he must recognize that it is he who is asked. Again, outside yourself, someone, something is saying, what's the meaning of your life? You don't ask the question, but someone gives you the question. Mm -hmm. What must we do to be saved? In a word, each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. Thus, logotherapy sees in responsibleness the very essence of human existence. What are you going to do with the time that you've been given? Take ownership of your life. Seems very reasonable. Of course. Read Jocko Willing. That's why Jocko is so popular. This is Jocko's whole point. Discipline equals freedom. And I guess, so if we're being critical, we're saying this isn't necessarily theological. No, it's therapeutic. And therefore, in an earthly sense, yeah, absolutely. It might help you. Yeah, it might. But it actually doesn't answer the question of sin is the point. It doesn't. And that's why we always want to talk, we talk about holding that tension between salvation and vocation, that Mm. yes, they are, one flows out of the other and certainly has a a reference point. But yet, if we turn our vocation into the means of our salvation, if we read Frankel and then turn this into a theological problem to be solved— in the church, capital C church, then we're mixing two disparate things together. And when we mix two things together that confuse vocation and salvation, we always sell out the, the first art, the first table of the commandments. Yep. <laughs> always. Well, and like you said, um, Frankel turns this logotherapy into his own little like cottage industry, right? I mean, this yes, is what he's talking for. And, it, and it's kind of artificially made up, the term and whatnot. Yeah, it absolutely. reminded me, though, of another guy who's basically got a career now on a term that he coined, which was moralistic therapeutic deism, Christian mm-hmm. Smith, right, from Notre Dame. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he made a name for himself with that term because it actually fits and it's very appropriate. But that's oh, actually... His his diagnostic of where we are today, being moralistic and therapeutic, Dias, mm-hmm. that's what Frankel's advocating for. Yeah. So it's the, it is the application of Frankel into religious life right. of, of our people. It's it's very much like a rugby scrum. Someone throws the ball and then we all chase it and someone picks it up and runs with it for a little <laughs> bit and we tackle him and then he kicks it down the field some more. I've got a puppy and uh, my <laughs> smaller children don't oh, seem I to understand. Oh, I thought you were going to about kicking puppies. No, no, no. My smaller <laughs> okay. children don't seem to understand that when they run, that says to the puppy, it's time to run right, and exactly. chase after me and tackle me. Yeah. Right? It's like, it's just simple. Just walk, be calm. And then right. he'll be calm. And like, yeah, no, no that's impossible it. for children and puppies. So, so then they're all running all over the place and the dog's chasing them. Of course. They're having a grand time. Yeah. The dog's exactly. search for meaning is pretty shallow, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning of life is, I, it's very simple, I think. It's, it's it like, really is. It's like a very small child. <laughs> yeah. Eat, sleep, and be merry. So, skipping down then to the meaning of love, love is the only way to grasp another human being. So, if we think about what it means, the response to the external request or question, what is the meaning of your life, is to take responsibility for the question, what's the meaning of your life? Mm -hmm. For Frankel, then, this comes down to the meaning of love and the meaning of suffering. So, first, the meaning of love. So, he gets this too, right? Is that the meaning of life is to love and to suffer. And to love in return. Yeah. So, love is the only way to grasp another human being in the innermost core of his personality, or we would call that the soul in theological language, Mm -hmm. or philosophical, actually. No one can become fully aware of the very essence of another human being unless he loves him. You know, like your soul mate. Mm. By his love, he is enabled. There's that word. See, Enabling, for those of you listening, yep. Gillespie and I have heard this word enable so often in the last probably 10 or 20 years. 
that it's it's like the word journey. It just it's an automatic tip off, and that it's the synonyms. person you're talking to is full of it. Right. We have equipping, enabling. Yes, and equipping, and enabling, empowering is another empowering, one. Empowering, yes. And the the reason what the, what we're talking about specifically is people will apply these terms to the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. That it's not the Holy Spirit who does it, but it's the Holy Spirit who enables, empowers, and enlivens and enlivens us to do it. Again, it's this language of agency that we've talked about before. No, He is the Lord of life. <laughs> he is the Lord of life, and we are His agents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are His minions. So, think about this, again, applied theologically. No one can become fully aware of the very essence of another human being, that is to know someone truly, authentically, unless he loves him. By his love, he is enabled to see the essential traits and features in the beloved person. Wow. And even more, he sees that which is potential in him. Every acorn is a potential oak tree. Capability, yeah. Yeah, that's straight up Aristotelian stuff which is not yet actualized, but yet should or ought to be actualized. Furthermore, by his love, the loving person enables the beloved person to actualize these potentialities. By making him aware of what he can be and of what he should become, he makes these potentialities come true. Huh. You're the master of your own destiny. This is a straight up medieval theology because mm-hmm. of the obvious drenching, the marinade of Aristotle here in Aristotle's ethics. With, it, with that like um, external substance being given to yep. allow yep. you to accomplish what you Right. Why do we, I, I just read this this morning in a meme, <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that the purpose of life is to, no, it was in a book I'm reading by Kyle Carpenter, You're Worth It. And Kyle talks about this, that, you know, his personality is... I pull people out of the shadows, int- you know, and basically introduce them into social circles and get them socializing and make them, you know, that he is the person who encourages and motivates other people to be better mm. and to be the best version of themselves. That's what he thrives on is making, is helping other people realize their potential. And here it is written in the fifties. That is, we see in other people what they're capable of. But they themselves don't. This goes back to the question of what's the meaning of your life? So I look at you, Gillespie, and say, I see so much potential in you, right? We, we hear this a lot in high school coaches, oh, yeah. college coaches, but we hear this in church all the time too. And I see your potential, but you don't see your true, your true potential. Hmm. And so what is my responsibility? To help you uh, achieve your true potential, to see and unlock your true potential, to become an Olympic athlete, to become the best version of yourself that you can become spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Never mind like genetics or right. uh, yeah. <laughs> the actual physical like yeah, capability. Or just, yeah, just maybe I don't want to. <laughs> well, it, my, uh, one of my sons actually corrected me yesterday because I'm like, well, you're born with skill, you know, and then it's developed. And they're like, no, mm-hmm. skill is learned. And actually, I think he was right, right? I mean, you gain skill um, through practice, through discipline. Right, right. right. But, but it actually, it is relevant whether you have... Um, you know, an inherent capacity for those right. things. Like if you're disabled, I mean, you're it, physically disabled, it's going to limit your capacity. I know nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> right. You know, but it's like, right. no, you're not going to be able to run. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to have an assist device, whatever that right. is, for example. On the other hand, I highly recommend the documentary Murder Ball for anyone who's curious about this. <laughs> it's about guys in wheelchairs who uh, play a ball game, rugby, I think it is. Or anyways, it's Murder Ball. You got to go watch it. It's a great documentary, actually. It's yeah. a very good documentary. Yeah, no, it's, but it's a different thing is the point. But you have to adapt. Yeah. yeah. And that's the point that, that Frankl's making is we don't tell them that because they're in wheelchairs, they're no longer meaningful, but rather we encourage them then to take a different path. Yeah, to seek meaning. They're, yeah, exactly. Seek meaning. And uh, that their, their disability doesn't change the direction of their life so much as it changes the way in which they get there. Right. It doesn't limit their capacity for meaning. It just changes how that's going to be realized. In fact, you thrive not, so you thrive because of your disability, not, it's like saying, you know, because I'm in a wheelchair, I am this type of a person. So being in a wheelchair made me this type of person. No, I was this person before I was in the wheelchair. This wheelchair has basically compelled me, forced me to realize Mm -hmm. my potential and, and to say, hey, I'm in a situation where I'm limited physically, but I'm not going to allow that to define me. 
Right, exactly. Mm. It's like Kyle says, the guy who threw, the, the Taliban fighter who threw the grenade and blew me up, I'm not going to allow that person to be the controlling force for the rest of my life forward. But rather, as a consequence of that grenade, I'm going to take that and use it as fuel to move in this direction, which I would have gone anyways. But now I'm really motivated to do this so that that's basically my revenge against this person who tried to destroy me. Right. And so we see this, I see this in pastoral care all the time, right? Like I said, when you're trained in seminary, especially, or do you just grow up in the language of psychotherapy, which is masked with theological language, covered with it, you tend, the pastors do this all the time. Yeah, well, I was just think, thinking about that bedside uh, conversation, you know, about searching for meaning or pleasure or power or the will eulogy. or ability, right? But, but, you know, what have I said to them? Well, but right. you can still pray. Right. So I've actually still tried to give them some agency <laughs> in in their own meaning. Right. How often do you even apply to your own self in those situations? I've got to say something meaningful to this person right now. Mm-hmm. I can't walk out of this room feeling like there it is, feeling like I didn't say or do something useful, meaningful to them. Or I missed an opportunity. Right, exactly. Versus uh did you bring the sacrament? Did you hold Christ up before them? Yes. Well, then you did your job. That's enough. You did what you call. Yeah, that's enough. That you were an instrument. So in logotherapy, love is not interpreted as a mere phenomenon, epiphenomenon. And you can. There's a footnote to epiphenomenon. We'll post the link in the show notes. But basically, it's a, it's a consequence of an action. Is basically what it is. Mm-hmm. I do something. He's saying it's and, not. It's not right. So love is not a consequence. So you do something kind to me, and then I love you in return. That's not love. (laughs) It's not a consequence of like your sexual drive that you satisfy me physically Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. therefore I I love love you because again, you, what you do for me. And like I've said before, whether it's a spouse or girlfriend, boyfriend or a child or whatever, someone you love, I want you to tell me why you love that person, but you are not allowed to list anything that they do for you. (laughs) Now see how hard that is. (laughs) They fulfill me. It's nearly impossible, actually, when you really start getting down to it. I don't actually know why I love this person. That's right. Right. That's like, why do you love your wife? She's the complete opposite of everything that I find pleasing in the opposite sex. And that's the point. Is like the first time I saw her, I knew I was going to marry her. I fell in love with her the first time I saw her. And yet along the way, the old Adam brain's like, but she's nothing like the women that you want. And God's like, that's why I gave her to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this isn't the woman you want. This is the woman you need. The woman you want will kill you in your sleep because she's a psychopath. That's the kind of woman that I want in my life. But I'm saying the woman that you need is a good godly woman who's going to basically, through her love and support of you, forgive you and put – basically, I'm going to use her to put a fence around you. Right. Again, I keep a close wa- watch on this heart of mine, as Johnny Cash saying. Well, that's love that actually t- is um... – has effort attached to it. Exactly. And that's why it's even, even after 21 years of marriage, if you, ever, if you said to me, okay, well, you said that about Annie when you first met in the first years of your marriage. Okay, but what do you love about her now? I actually gave up trying to do that a while ago because I realized how juvenile it was. Well, and, I think if you could distill it down, it's probably the same thing. Right. It's whatever's left, actually. Right. Yeah, whatever <laughs> is left, that's why I love her. But mm-hmm. I couldn't actually explain to you why I love her. Yeah, because my yeah. love isn't... Physical, it isn't emotional, it's not intellectual love anymore. We've been married too long for any of that. But yeah. rather, I just love her. Mm-hmm. And you could say it's shared struggle. It's shared. It's a shared experience of struggle and, and doing it together. But that's still what we did for each other. And it's not that, it's beyond that even. Well, I think, I think if you're going to distill it down, it's that givenness, right? Exactly. You know, yeah. you love your children. Well, why? Because they're given to you. To, right, exactly. Given to they're you. They're not your product. They're not something you right. created I mean, as much right. as you'd like to believe that. Right. And so maybe that's the that's the root answer is if you take away everything that they do for you, what's left except that they were given to you. It's mm-hmm. what God does for you. Mm-hmm. Just like that, just like uh, your pastor, your your congregation, mm-hmm. your neighbors next door. Uh, right. They're, they're put there. You're put there. However you want to look at it, either and, either direction. And that's a good explanation of what we talk about all the time of mis- like we use the fruit, we use the creation, we worship the creation instead of the creator. Yeah. It's the same thing is that what we do for each other defines love versus what God does for us by giving to the mm-hmm. wife, the pastor, the congregation. And so we always make this mistake. We always fall into that ditch, though, of, well, I'll judge you by what you do. I'll love you based on what you do. I'll forgive you based on what you do. 
rec- not recognizing, but God gave this to you. This is well, a gift. I mean, ironically, we do um, define God's love for us in what he did for us. Yeah, which you is know? fine. That's the point. I mean, he says, no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So, right. I mean, it's very clear. <laughs> this right. is how the love of God is made manifest and that Christ, you know, is given for us. Which is why we even us. take that verse and we turn it into a verse that we read on Veteran or Memorial Day at the cemetery oh, about right. veterans. Yeah. Without a hint of irony. It's kind of a general abstract yeah. concept rather than a very right. precise day and moment. Yeah. Which, by the way, is when you realize your true actuality is when you sacrifice your life for the sake of another person. Hmm. Especially in a noble cause. So, you can't, like, love isn't, can't be interpreted as a consequence of your sexual drive or the instincts in the sense of a so called sublimation. Love is a primary, is as primary a phenomenon as sex, meaning love is its own thing. thing. It's love yeah. is love. Mm-hmm. Normally, sex is a mode of expression for love. Sex is, this is written in the 50s, by the way. So, this is like uh, Kinsey. Kinsey. Yep. Yeah. So this is a big deal, the sexual revolution when he's writing this. Love is as primary phenomenon as sex. Normally, sex is a mode of expression for love. Sex is justified and even sanctified hmm. as soon as, but only as long as it is a vehicle of love. Yeah, there there's, it is. A, there's theology language right there. Yeah. Sanctified, yep. made holy. Yes. Sex is justified as soon as it's a vehicle of love. It's even sanctified. It's made a holy thing within the vehicle of love. I talk with young people about this regularly, that se- like sexual intimacy is not a true expression of love. But how many young people say, if you love me, or because we love each other, we need to take our relationship to the next level, which is also Aristotelian language, Yeah, right? It's the next step up that staircase. And so, we need to, we need to elevate our relationship to a higher love. And the way that we get there is through physical expressions of that love. But as I tell oh, people, I thought, it, I thought it was through old school R and B, right? Well, I mean, it's Marvin Gaye, obviously. <laughs> but <laughs> I knew the reference, right? But that's what I mean. Is when I explain to them that your virginity is actually a gift that you can give away, but no one really knows that or comprehends it until after you've given it away, and Absolutely. you actually yep. feel that loss. You feel like, oh, there's something missing now. Like I tell people this all the time, and it freaks them out. Is like I can actually tell when you've had sex because you're different. Mm-hmm. You don't see it, but I see it because I've been there. Right. And all the adults in the room that pay attention to it, they see it too. So you're not fooling anybody. But, in, and this is a great point Franco brings up, in our society, though, love and sex are nearly equitable. Right, or synonymous. I mean, especially in pop culture. They're definitely synonymous in pop culture. It's the expectation. And then that translates itself into the culture. Which is a degradation of love. Oh, Huge. Love is not understood as a mere side effect of sex. Rather, sex is a way of expressing the experience of that ultimate togetherness, which is called love. Okay. I'm all right with that. Sex is a way of expressing the experience of that ultimate togetherness, which is called love. The third way of finding a meaning in life is by suffering, which is a consequence of actually getting married. But (laughs) You search for meaning, so you get married, and then you suffer. And then you suffer, and then you discover the meaning of life. (laughs) That's it. It's a circle. <laughs> it's the so, circle of life in the Lion King. It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. But it's interesting that he makes this turn because coming, you know, reflecting on his experience in the concentration camps, that's not where I would expect him to turn. But because I think of the influence of the sexual revolution, he is bringing up that point. He is thinking mm. through that point. Mm. But it's still strange that he wouldn't turn that back on to the community, love in the in the context of a broader community, yeah. and serving the broader community. It's a very, yeah. it's a narrow definition of love. Yeah, it's very narrow. It's very selfish. It is. But, well, I, but I this, imagine his suffering is going to be corporate, though. Well, I was going to say, and remember that one of the foundational points for this whole logotherapy is Kierkegaard, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is existentialism, which is inherently about me as the individual over and against the group. Right. All right, dear listeners, that's the end of part one of our consideration of Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, We're going to hold off there, and you'll have to wait till the next episode uh, to pick up where we left off, which is to consider suffering. So join us uh, in just a few short days, and we'll keep going with Victor Frankl. Love you.